Okay, good morning. <clears throat> I'm Nancy Roman, President and CEO of Partnership for a Healthier America, and I'm delighted to be here. As any new parent of young children knows, feeding your kids is a big job, and it isn't always the easiest because you want them to enjoy food and have what they like, but you also want them to eat the right things, right? And to grow up healthy. And sometimes these things seem to be at odds. They really don't have to be. While the early years have their challenges, no doubt, they also represent a remarkable time of growth when habits form and follow into childhood and adolescence. Evidence suggests there's this golden window of opportunity when we can cultivate taste preferences. Today, <clears throat> we want to share what we know about why first foods matter and help how you can help change the trajectory of children's health in this country. At PHA, we're working to transform the food landscape in pursuit of health equity. And we're so excited to announce our latest effort. Now, I hope you'll read our new paper reviewing the science supporting early frequent vegetable consumption. But I'll highlight for you the four main takeaways. So first, despite vegetables being critical to a healthy life, infants, toddlers, and preschoolers just don't eat enough of them. Only about 10% of children consume the daily recommended amounts of vegetables and even fewer adolescents do. Second, Kids can learn to love vegetables, but unlike the sweet flavor of fruit, which kids are born to love, veggie flavors are an acquired taste. It takes practice, perhaps as many as 10 tries. Third, the default strategy used by industry and parents to hide or mix vegetables and other foods just doesn't work. Pressuring kids doesn't work either. What does work is repeated exposure early in life. And finally, for any of this to stick, parents and caregivers must model the behavior they hope to see. Eating more vegetables is yet another example where what I do is more effective than do what I say. So these new insights about how taste preferences develop require parents too, not just kids. Some call that a multi-generational approach. So today, PHA is proud to announce a consumer awareness and evidence-based public education campaign with a generation of veggie lovers as the end game. The campaign called Veggies Early and Often aims to educate parents, caregivers, health professionals, and significantly baby food makers about the critical importance of early and repeated exposure to vegetables. We invite all parents, caregivers, and early child care providers. We invite all leaders in healthcare, in education, and the food industry to take action with us. We're working with baby and toddler food makers to reformulate or create new appealing affordable foods that put vegetables first. Our icon, which you see there on the screen with the broccoli and PHA's logo, will be a reliable indicator for parents and consumers, helping them to differentiate which vegetable products actually contain meaningful amounts of vegetables. PHA hopes that companies will use these standards to reformulate existing commercial baby food products or to create new veggie forward baby and toddler food products in line with these criteria at all price points in the marketplace and, and certainly at affordable price points. We're working with health professionals to share the science behind this effort. It's just so critical that pediatricians and other health professionals get the importance of early and repeated exposure to vegetables. And we're working with early childhood educators to reformulate menus so there are more vegetable entrees and more vegetable snacks every single day and every single week. Ultimately, our goal is to shift the conversation from one that claims kids don't like vegetables 
to kids can learn to love vegetables. And we want to build a consumer movement for veggie first foods and plant-based options for the youngest children that support both human and planetary health. So now I'd like to share a quick message from some of the partners involved in this campaign launch, starting with friend of PHA and NBA legend, Paul Gasol, before turning it over to our terrific panel. Hi, I'm Pau Gasol, NBA champion, president of the Gasol Foundation, UNICEF global champion for nutrition and zero childhood obesity, and father to a beautiful four-month-old baby girl. I'm excited to support PHA's Veggies Early and Often campaign because I think it will be a huge step forward in educating parents, caregivers, educators, health professionals, and industry leaders about the importance of veggies at a very early age. This campaign is important to me because I am personally very committed to raising awareness about the link between nutrition and health outcomes. At the Gasol Foundation, we envision a world where all children will enter adulthood physically and mentally equipped to live successful, healthy, and productive lives. I appreciate that this campaign is rooted in research and uh, will inspire raising a generation of veggie lovers. Here's what I hope this campaign can accomplish. First, I hope that Veggies Early and Often campaign will help parents understand children are born with an innate preference for, for the flavors of veggies. And it takes time and practice for kids to learn to love veggies and become healthy and adventurous eaters. Second, I hope firsthand that parents turn to their pediatricians for advice about when and how to feed their children. And I hope pediatricians and health professionals will use PHA's paper that reviews the evidence to support why young eaters need veggies early and often and make it part of their conversations with parents in a patient setting. Hi, I'm Betsy Four, co-founder and co-CEO of Tiny Organics. At Tiny, we're built upon the belief that an entire generation of children can fall in love with vegetables from the very first bites. So we bake this into our core proposition around the company that 80 of our 100 first flavors are vegetables and that majority of our products are savory forward, meeting the veggie and early and often's requirements. We are so excited about this campaign and as it couldn't be more aligned with our core values and what we want to bring to the nation to raise a generation that could be free from chronic disease and obesity later in life to grow up to be the healthiest versions of themselves. We are so thrilled to partner with PHA on this initiative and can't wait to set a new industry standard in the market for what it means to introduce vegetables from the earliest days. We are proud to be a part of PHA's Veggies Early and Often campaign because as a pediatrician-led team, we understand the importance of establishing healthy eating habits early. Absolutely. The Dr. Young Project is a partner of the Veggies Early and Often campaign because we are so excited to be able to reach even more pediatricians and teachers and parents to help them learn how to raise healthy, happy eaters. We hope to show families that an understanding of feeding development mm -hmm. and a joyful approach to the introduction of veggies and other whole foods can help establish a foundation of healthy eating for life. Hi, I'm Bonnie Johnson, the registered dietitian with Good Feeding. We joined this campaign because veggies early and often is at the core of our mission and vision. We believe that by introducing babies to a variety of flavors from the very beginning, we can grow healthy, adventurous eaters who not only choose vegetables, but enjoy eating them too. Okay, well, what a great group of partners. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our panel today. Um, I'll start off with Dr. Kari Cotwright. She is an assistant professor of food and nutrition at the University of Georgia. Her research agenda focuses on childhood obesity prevention in schools and in early childhood settings. She's a registered and licensed dietitian. Previously, she worked as a research fellow at the CDC where she helped implement former First Lady Michelle Obama's Let's Move initiative. 
Um, welcome, Kari. Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you. Um, Betsy Four, who you just met on the video, um, is the co-founder and co-CEO of Tiny Organics. She was on the list of Forbes 30 Under 30 and BBC's 100 Most Inspiring Women. She has more than a decade of experience as an inventor, product founder, and CEO. Betsy serves on the Tufts School of Nutrition and Policy Innovation Council, and her company, Tiny Organics, is an inaugural partner of the Veggies Early and Often campaign. Welcome, Betsy. Thank you so much, Nancy. And last but not least, Darlena Birch is of the National WIC Association. She is a registered dietitian and the senior public health nutritionist for the National Association. Her work includes representing the association on various committees, both inside and outside the organization. Welcome, Darlena. Thank you, Nancy. So um, I hope we'll have time to take questions at the end. Um, so you can, you can put your questions into the Q&A function as they arise throughout the conversation. But I wanna start off with just a really simple question for all three of you, which is what does veggies early and often mean to you and um, why does it matter? Perhaps we can just start off in the order I introduced you. Okay, well, thanks so much, Nancy. I am so happy to be here and so excited about this campaign. And when I think about what it means to me, it's some of the things that were mentioned about creating adventurous eaters. And so there are so many wonderful flavors in vegetables and we know they have so many uh, wonderful effects on our health long-term. So if we can introduce uh, veggies early to children, I think that is just a key to promoting great health long-term. I am really excited about uh, some of the things that came out in the article when you said, what does it mean to me? So as a registered dietitian, I love the fact that we are promoting the fact that it, repeated exposure is something that is very necessary. And I love the idea that you can just do simple taste tests. Moms don't have to sit or caregivers don't have to sit and be intimidated. If a child doesn't want something just at mealtime, you can do quick taste and, and to introduce those flavors and get kids interested and excited about eating vegetables. So it matters because we want to make sure that our children are healthy and long-term. We want to make sure that we are role modeling. And in my research and even in my own life as a mom of three little girls, it is so important. So I'm so excited to be a part of the campaign. Okay. Mm -hmm. In a minute, I'm going to come back to you on those little girls because I like those stories. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. We're so thrilled to be involved as this completely aligns with our mission, as you'd heard a moment ago. At Tiny, we believe in introducing a variety of textures and flavors to expose children to foods from around the world and to build adventurous eaters for life. So 80 of Tiny's 100 first flavors are savory, meeting the veggies early and often requirements. Uh, we're 100% organic, completely vegan, no added salt, no added sugar, and no more than five grams of natural sugars in any of our products. So when mom feeds Tiny to her baby, she knows this is a truly vegetable forward product, that their baby's being exposed to vegetables and it's exceeding the recommended portion of vegetables daily. Um, personally, this has been a, a lifelong ambition of mine, uh, having been vegetarian for 15 years. I know the life-changing benefits of eating a plant-based diet and it's the greatest joy I could have given to my son, Sebastian, to see him eating tiny and, and loving vegetables from the earliest days. Mm -hmm. Uh, did he like vegetables from the first taste? <laughs> yeah, he, he's been eating tiny since six months old. So he actually prefers vegetables. So he's now two and a half mm -hmm. um, and, and we're thrilled. <laughs> so um, Darlena. Thanks, Nancy. Um, for the National WIC Association being the advocacy and lobbying voice for the WIC community, veggies early and often means for us working to ensure that WIC participants continue to have access to fresh frozen and canned fruits and vegetables um, through the cash value voucher, which is often uh, abbreviated as CVV within our community. Um, it's a dollar amount that is provided to WIC participants for the purchase of these um, of the produce. So even though the CVV can be used to purchase fruits, it has also increased vegetable cons um, consumption among participants. It wasn't until 2009 that the CVV was first included within the WIC food package. So it's a fairly new addition for the WIC program. And we're just very excited to be able to get 
um, to increase the access that our participants have to purchasing fresh produce. Um, and so following the changes to those 2009 WIC food package, research has shown that uh, it has improved access of healthy foods, including whole grains, vegetables, and lower fat milk for WIC participants, as well as the community at large. Um, and so they found that it does actually help not only increase access of vegetables for WIC participants, but even within the communities that they live in, which is often food deserts. Um, therefore, veggies matter to the WIC community because WIC is a nutrition education program that promotes healthy eating among WIC participants, and this includes vegetable consumption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, critical. I, I think our audience probably knows, but women, infant, and children, the federal program that really provides food base for pregnant mothers and their children is really so critical to getting um, the right foods early to, the, to folks who need it. Um, so I'm going to, there's a lot to unpack in each of your comments, but I just want to put one more general uh, question to the three of you about barriers. So, you know, we all know, we all have a shared agenda of more vegetable consumption for the youngest kids and all the way up. It's just key to health. It's key to so many things and even sustainability. Um, but it isn't always easy. You saw the stat that I referenced earlier, fewer than 10% of the youngest children are getting the recommended daily allowance, only 2% of adolescents, if you can believe that. So, um, what are, what are we, what's going wrong? Where are the barriers? Well, Nancy, one of the things I think of here at the University of Georgia, I direct the Childhood Obesity Prevention Lab. And so we have several barriers. One is that uh, other types of food seem to be more exciting. So we have to have catalysts to get kids interested in eating fruits and vegetables and make it adventurous and fun. And I'm also really concerned about equity. So when we think about uh, having a directive to eat more vegetables, we want to make sure that people have access to vegetables and not only have that access, but have the skills to prepare them in a way that the child and the family can enjoy them. And so we have to do that work as, as nutrition educators, as registered dietitians um, and make sure that people have what they need in order to um, promote vegetables to young children. And one of the ways I do that in my lab is through, or, or even at home, I do it through songs, uh, doing things like uh, bringing home carrots with the stem to get my children excited about it. And so um, there are a lot of ways that we can get kids excited and use that as a catalyst to, to get them to continually to try, to continue to try to, uh, to try more fruits and vegetables or vegetables specifically. Mm -hmm. I think another factor, Nancy, is that children tend to be prone to sweet foods. So this is, you know, as the research shows, given mother's breast milk or formula, you know, their first foods and, the, and actually the first bites, if they are eating a parade um, diet early days, tend to be fruit. So what we've done at Tiny is try to introduce, you know, vegetables in a way that's not hidden, right? So, so much of the industry standard is saying, let's hide vegetables and more fruits to make it sweeter. This is unnecessary, right? And your PHA paper says that, the research shows. Um, it's not only not unnecessary, it actually is setting a child up to continue to want um, the, the sweet foods. There's nothing wrong with fruits, and of course, in moderation. But for us, if we can introduce veggies first, then we've realized, and through our own research as well at Tiny, that children can learn to love vegetables and actually crave them because it is an acquired taste. Um, so for us, you know, that barrier is kind of that 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 you know, the American diet is kind of prone to sweetness in terms of the way that we've been served fruits and parades. And I know we're going to get more into that uh, a bit later, but um, that that doesn't need to be a blocker. And actually, if we can introduce veggies earlier, as we know, it can set up a child for the lifelong benefits. Yeah, it's a very good point. You know, one of the things I'm struck by when you reverse engineer and figure out what went wrong, it's virtually always born of something of good intent. I think when, um, when parents and baby food makers started putting sweet fruits in with vegetables, it was obviously the thinking was that they would be more palatable. And, you know, that is true. And, and it just wasn't um, the unintended consequence of um, fortifying, intensifying the preference for sweet, you know, really wasn't considered. But I always say there's no reason to blame anyone. It's just like, now let's start mating, making the adjustments, you know. Darlene, what about your perspective from the, you know, looking at it from Wick's perspective? Uh, what are the challenges? 
So I know I mentioned it a little bit in my response to the first question, but uh, essentially food deserts. Um, so, you know, as I'm sure many attendees are aware, participating in WIC, um, participants include women, infants, and children, as long as they meet income guidelines. So a lot of the WIC community is low income. And essentially it goes back to um, the issues of health equity that Dr. Jackson also mentioned. Um, and so for the WIC community, addressing the issue of food deserts is one way in which to help reduce the barriers of eating uh, a variety of vegetables. And since the implementation of this cash value voucher within the WIC program, like I said, we've actually found research to prove that, um, you know, WIC not only increases access to vegetables for WIC participants, but also for the neighborhoods and communities in which they live. And for us, that's one of the biggest barriers is just increasing access to vegetables. Absolutely. And I have to say at PHA, we are all about that. I mean, uh, at every single level, that's a core piece of our work. And um, one we aim to amplify and expand in the coming year. Um, so turning to you, Carrie, uh, you know, you touched on it in your remarks about, you know, um, providing for your daughters carrots with the stems on which they like more than carrots without the stems. Um, your, your credentials are just great. You know, you're a dietitian, you've been with the CDC, but I think maybe your greatest credential is just being mom to those girls. And I liked hearing about your stories of the kinds of things you did to engage your own children, particularly when I learned you have a three-year-old who loves salad. <laughs> so tell us a little more about your own tactics. Well, I, I think that's really important. And so it, as, it's really great for me to be engaging in early childhood education research and, and looking at this topic of increasing fruit and vegetable consumption with young children as I engage because I practice what I preach. And so I have three little ones, Kamara, Camille, and Cameron. And we really just started very early, you know, at, at six months, engaging them in tasting different um, vegetables. We started with vegetables first. And so, um, again, just having quick taste, having them, helping them to prepare things uh, with me and just continuing to expose them. We know that the research says that it may take 10 or more times for a child to like vegetables. And so that repeated exposure is so important. And when we think about that, um, just having the, the child to learn certain things. So some of the things we teach is what color is it? What's the taste? Is it sweet or bitter? Where does it grow? And so when we're thinking about those core messages, it's really important because the children like to learn about it. So one way that we do this in my house is through songs. And so we do this in our, my lab as well. And I, we have a song called the Broccoli Song. And I kind of shared it for you. So I'll just tell you, it kind of goes to the tune of ABC. So it's broccoli, so yummy and so crunchy, full of fiber and vitamin C. Broccoli, raw or cooked for you and me, he broccoli. And we sing that every time we have broccoli and the kids go wild. And so we just have fun songs, we engage, we touch, we go to the store and I allow them to pick a new vegetable or fruit. And so all of those things are tactics that parents can use. And also just meet your kids where you are. I know as a mother and as a researcher, it's so disappointing when you go and you buy a new vegetable and you prepare it and then you get the, the, the wrinkled face and they don't wanna try it. And so just be encouraged. I think that's so important for us to tell caregivers to be encouraged to continue to buy these things. And when we think about being equitable, a lot of times, Frozen vegetables are cheaper and that gives you a chance to try. So we can take those frozen vegetables, we can prepare them for our children and we haven't spent too much, but it allows us to give that repeated exposure. And so we do those things, we cook together, we join together. And, and fortunately they have learned to love vegetables just like the pan campaign has said. And I've said always in my research, I wanna be the lady that's known for getting kids to eat their veggies. So I gotta get my kids to do it first. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's great. And I, I'm glad you made the point about frozen vegetables being less expensive. Um, there, a lot of people may think they're less nutritious, but not, not so. No. Is that Nancy froze a little bit or is it me? Well, I'll, I'll say something while Nancy is coming back um, about the uh, frozen vegetables. I'm sure she'll be back on in just a second. And when we think about the frozen vegetables, I love, I, I read somewhere where they said it was uh, like nature's, nature's freezing time, right? And so that we know that frozen vegetables 
are just as healthy as those fresh ones because the time clock has stopped and they're less expensive. There you go, Nancy. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's maybe the first time that's ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> but I was saying, you know, a lot of people think frozen is, you know, more, you know, less nutritious and really not the case. Um, uh, very interesting. Well, I, I wanted to ask you, um, in the paper, what stood out? You referenced one of the points about the 10 times. I know as a mother, that really struck me um, that, you know, my kids are grown, but I wish that I had known the contents of this paper when I was raising my kids younger. Um, because I think the tendency is you expose your child She's freezing just a little bit, but I know where she was headed. I know she was asking about, um, Nancy was asking about exposure and some of the things that really stood out in the paper. There you are, Nancy. <laughs> Sorry about this. No problem. Um, but anyway, onward. So you, you asked me about some of the things that really stood out to me. So of course that repeated exposure, and, and I'll just give another key point. That point about really just doing a finger test, the mom taking a finger and say, hey, just taste this really quickly. I love that because it's intimidating sometimes for moms to sit down and prepare for mealtime with baby and not know whether or not they're going to like the vegetable or even our young kids. And so again, just having the confidence to say, just have a quick bite, either you like it or you don't. And even in my house, we'll give it a vote. So I say, give it a thumbs down, a middle or a, a, a thumbs up if you really like it, but you have to try it. Let's just taste it and try it. And so I think that's important. And another thing that was really central to me was the fact that caregivers must model eating vegetables. And you called it a multi-generational approach. And I find that to be so effective in terms of my household and even in my research when I hear from other parents that I tried the vegetable and sometimes even trying a new vegetable with your child is really something that is so important. And so getting our uh, caregivers, our parents, our early care and education providers to model those he healthy vegetables and to begin a dialogue. And so how do we do that um, in terms of picking out certain things that we will uh, teach our children and, and make it interesting and fun. And so, you know, uh, one of my former mentors, Leanne Birch, did a lot of work, a lot of groundbreaking work on repeated exposure. And so I just think that if we can get our parents to just know that we are just trying and continuing to expose that that is uh, so important. So those two, two key points, role modeling and repeated exposure were really, really special to me in the paper and they stood out. Yeah, interesting. Okay, I'm going to turn to Betsy. And before I do, I have to say, if I go down again, just carry on among yourselves. I don't know what's <laughs> happening. This is the first for me to lose my connection. Um, so um, I, I just wanted to, you know, ask you, Betsy, because you're there with the industry. Um, you know, well, but let me start with this. How, what how, what got you started? You're a vegetarian, but what got you started down this path? Yep, absolutely. So yes, I'm a vegetarian, but that took re-engineering my body because I actually grew up in a food desert. So I was on this kind of sugar roller coaster. And I think much like uh, most 80s babies in America, you know, was on the parade diet, which there's nothing wrong with. But then if you continue that um, cycle of, you know, being, of, of, of craving sugar as, as you grow, um, then as we know, there's, there's health, health outcomes to that. Um, so for, for myself, you know, having, ha having a veggie first approach really changed my life. So I, when I wanted to bring that uh, to, to my son, I thought, you know, when my co-CEO and I built Tiny, she's an immigrant. And so we both came from this place of trying to figure out how, how could we, for childhood development, development make the biggest difference in a child's life, and we realize it is through vegetable introduction. And so that's really the core of how we kind of came up with Tiny and wanted to build this company together. Um, was around trying trying to bring that accessibility to all, right? Because th that's where we're coming from. So the, the our north star at Tiny is that we would one day be on Wick. Um, you know, this is this is a goal, and this is something that we're we're, we're trying to 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 do. We are launching retail next year. We're currently direct to consumer and totally frozen. So as you were talking about Dr. Kari, absolutely agreed with that um, around, you know, frozen is the next best thing. The fresh sometimes even better because it's more convenient for mom, right? She can take it out just as she does her breast milk, you know, put it in the fridge overnight or um, put it directly in microwave or on stovetop. 
So for us, that made a big difference in how we rolled out to the market as well. Mm -hmm. So now let's turn to the industry question, um, because obviously the industry has a real opportunity here to, I think, you know, help shift the culture. And it's a symbiotic relationship between the consumers and the industry. But just talk to me about how you see that. Absolutely. So as we roll out the veggies early and often icon, I really believe this is a new industry standard that we're setting so that when mom's walking the aisles at retail, she can look at this product and know this is a vegetable first product. And what that means is mainly vegetables ingredients in this product. There's no more than seven grams of natural sugars. And the first, the first um, ingredient is a vegetable. So, you know, right now, and I think, you know, that's, that's one of the things that the white paper talks a lot about as well is that there's kind of this mistrust around, you know, commercialized baby food being, uh, you know, ha having this sense of, of hidden, hidden veggies or like actually how many veggies are there, right? Now we'll know with PHA's new standard, we can roll that out to the masses so that we can empower and educate mom and dad, right? To, to know if this is a veggie forward product. So I believe it's a game changer uh, to be able to, you know, just gather an understanding of, you know, is this product vegetable forward? Yeah, absolutely. I keep saying, who knew? We thought we were feeding our kids, you know, carrots and peas, and we were feeding them pears and apples, you know. It's yeah. like, there is a sort of wow factor there. Um, yeah. what, one of the points you made earlier in our discussion was just about keeping things in plain sight. Um, so do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Absolutely. So, you know, neophobia is a thing that the paper talks about as well, right? But that um, a child around the age of two and, and above might might be opposed um, to trying new foods. Um, if we can if we can make them aware, as Dr. Kari was talking about, uh, around what a carrot should look like, right, should feel like, should smell like, and how crunchy and wonderful it is, right? If we can expose them to real vegetables, um, so in Tiny's products, you know, those those are all real. They're unmasked vegetables. Every single one a child could pick up, they can touch. You know, our our, our foods are meant to be um, leaning into the baby led weaning movement, where a child can can handle them themselves and know when they're full, you know, by feeding themselves and, and really more leaning into a Montessori way of, of approaching it as well. Um, but if we can, if we can show children, I just love that part in, in the paper. And if, 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 if anyone hasn't read it yet, please do. It's worth every minute. It's, it's just full of such good insights there and, and real research um, around this topic. Um, for us, yeah, it, it meant everything to be having veggies in plain sight uh, with our product. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Okay, Darlena. Um, so what do you think it will take to make more veggie forward options available, accessible and, and WIC accessible? I mean, obviously we want these veggie forward options to be WIC accessible. Um, what's the path to that? Um, so yeah, obviously the National WIC Association is happy to partner with PHA and participate in this Veggie Forwards campaign. And one of the biggest opportunities we see as an organization is simply representing the WIC voice um, to the community, um, both in within the WIC community, but then externally looking as well. And so one of the biggest hurdles that we find with not only like baby food manufacturers, but man food manufacturers in general is understanding, um, like navigating the process of applying into the WIC food package. And so, um, you know, we absolutely want to be here to help ex like essentially lay out the landscape because even though WIC is a federal nutrition program, um, it is an issue where uh, there's no federal, like there's no website or portal you go to to apply into every WIC food package. Every food package varies from state to state. And so the biggest challenge I think for fa food manufacturers, especially if they're the smaller companies, whereas like if you've got Post or General Mills, you know, they've got capacity to apply individually into every state, navigating that landscape as a small manufacturer is harder to do. And so, um, you know, just kind of explaining that process and, and being there to kind of help manufacturers have the confidence they feel to reach out to states themselves and apply into that food package is really important. Um, within WIC, there are a total of 90 state WIC agencies. So that's 90 state WIC food packages, um, 50 US states, five US territories and 33 Indian tribal organizations. Um, well, that is important, and PHA is all about um, trying to help in any way possible to make some of these options WIC accessible, because anything that's happening sort of at the consumer level and then in business, but they can be reinforced with the federal programs, it's just so critical. Um, 
So talk to me a little bit about um, the 2020 dietary guidelines. Um, they now include kids, you know, from zero to two for the first time. Um, it's sort of wild that we didn't <laughs> include kids previously. Um, but just share a little bit about what you think the significance of that development is. Um, so the biggest role for the dietary guidelines for Americans is the zero to two age group is within the WIC food pack or within the WIC program. And so that's the biggest um, opportunity we see. Um, the science of the WIC food package is, asked, is actually based on the dietary guidelines for Americans and the WIC food package undergoes review every 10 years. So this has been a very significant and momentous occasion for us because in 2017, NASM finished their um, review of the WIC food package, and now it is up to USDA to review the recommendations and decide which recommendations they would like to include in the WIC food package and which ones they will choose to, you know, maybe like look over or move in a different direction with. Um, and so this is really important because it really, um, you know, will help enforce the science and the nutrition recommendations upon which the food package is based and ultimately help improve the nutrition of all WIC participants, but specifically that zero to two years of age category. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Um, well, there's much more we could go into, but I am hoping that we can leave some time for questions for the audience. Um, so I'd like to um, go to another message from our partners. Hi, my name is Bettina Siegel and I'm the author of a book called Kid Food. And I really could not be prouder to be part of PHA's Veggies Early and Often initiative. And that's because when I was writing Kid Food and researching it, that's when I really learned about the importance of starting with veggies first in introducing solids to babies. And I think this campaign is going to be a huge step forward in spreading awareness about that and making it easier for parents to do it. Introducing veggies early and often matters because we started Little Gourmets based on our experiences as moms and how we saw firsthand the impact that introducing vegetable focused and flavorful foods can have on our kids' eating habits. Research continues to prove the importance of first foods and how they shape lifelong eating habits. So if we can begin to start educating parents everywhere about the importance of introducing veggies early and often, while also increasing our access to veggie first foods, then we can not only deliver nutrients to our littlest eaters, but start to create a new generation of veggie lovers, which could ultimately change the trajectory of health in America. Hello, my name is Saskia Sarosa, and I'm the founder and CEO of Fresh Bellies. We are proud supporters of the PHA Veggies Early and Often campaign. The Veggies Early and Often campaign is important and it matters because we now know through years of scientific research that eating veggies and savory flavors early on is the path to a healthier lifestyle. What we hope to accomplish by, by being part of this campaign is to continue to drive our mission of creating a new generation of healthy, adventurous eaters, starting with a child's early bites. And we want to continue to train those young palates to become accustomed to the flavors we expect them to eat when they get older from the very first bite. We're excited about this new program and can't wait to see the fruits of all of our collective labor. Okay. So um, questions are, are starting to um, come into the chat and I'll take a few of them uh, off the top. Um, so one, what are the requirements for veggies early and often? Um, the requirements really are that 50% or more of the foods for children under two include vegetables. Um, that's the primary requirement. And there are also requirements around no salt, no added preservatives, et cetera. And we're happy to share those and, and make them available. Um, there's also a question about how food banks could engage in this effort. And I know that might not be something, you know, you all have thought a lot about, but I'll share some of my perspective having formerly been um, a CEO of a food bank. And that is, you know, food bank, um, one of the greatest requests at food banks um, was for baby food more than almost any other single thing. And, um, <clears throat> Many families who are really struggling, you know, could come to the food bank and get good food for their families. But we had very 
little food for the earliest children. The way food banks operate currently, of course, is it's what grocery stores don't sell, you know, gets passed on. And um, it, it must have very much to do with the inventory. But I do know there's super high demand in the charitable food system for healthy food for the youngest eaters. So I'd be interested in any of your perspectives. I serve on the uh, board for our local food bank, which is the Food Bank of Northeast Georgia. And I think with everything, interestingly, of course, we've had some things with the pandemic that have had some great outcomes. And so in terms of that, we had uh, more increased funding. And then we had the things, that, uh, we had, uh, I'll say, efforts that gave more fresh fruits and vegetables to the community. And so I think that was great. And we've been coming up with um, innovative ways to partner with food banks in order to get these uh, fresh fruits and vegetables or, or whatever form we can get in terms of vegetables to the community. And so the other thing that we have to think about in partnering, of course, is again, having the, not only the access, but the skills to prepare the vegetables. But I've seen some really creative partnerships and just a drive to get out more fresh foods uh, with the food bank approach. And I think that's really encouraging. Okay, so, you know, Jasmine asks us, um, how can parents encourage a vegetable filled diet with a toddler when they have an older child who's not keen on vegetables? Younger siblings often wanna follow in the footsteps of their older siblings. I'll, I'll hop in there for that one because mine are seven, five, and three. And so when you think about that, of course, I kind of started early with my first daughter, but she can be very picky about certain tastes. And so I think what you want to do is start with a vegetable that everybody likes. And it might be something like the carrots with the stems where you can get excited. And when you bring in that fruit or vegetable, tell a story about it, get them engaged, allow them to help prepare it, maybe even start some seeds, you know, in your house so they, they can see how things grow. If you don't have time for that as a busy mom, you can look at different videos. YouTube is a great source for that. And so so they can see and engage. And there are many ways that we can engage and talk to children about uh, vegetables. So start with the favorites and then have a challenge possibly to try new ones. And in my house, we've done things like a, a fruit and vegetable chart where we chart every time we try a new vegetable. So your older child is leading, your younger child is following, and you're encouraging everyone in the house to do it, as well as modeling that uh, tasting vegetables on your own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to come in on that? I yeah, absolutely agree with that. And this idea of eating the rainbow is something that Tiny really leans into as each color offers different nutrients. And to your point, Dr. Kari, if you could introduce your older child to almost make it a game, right? Um, and, and can you get all the colors of the rainbow together? Um, I think it is, is crucial. The other thing, thing I would like to note, though, is that one of the things from the paper that really stood out to me was that parents' decisions about what, when, and how to offer foods to children can have as much influence as biology on the children's food preferences and acceptance. So in, in my mind, you know, I think we can do our part by modeling that um, as the parents to say like, we, we wanna eat these vegetables, right? They see them on our plate as well. And then that can get them even more excited, right? Like making um, vegetables we, like we chatted about earlier today, um, you know, fun and accessible and exciting. Yeah, interesting. So here's a question that's sort of near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, one of the listeners asked, because we both worked outside the home, baby food was a central part of the diet we fed our babies. Um, from, an, from an equity perspective, how do we get more high quality baby food like Tiny into low income households? Is D2C an option under WIC or SNAP, for example? And what about food banks? We did touch on food banks. But I do think this um, accessibility for all, you know, one of the things I've, I've struggled with um, in fighting for food equity for the last 20 years in various fora from the United Nations to the food bank to PHA is so often the very best things, you know, are, are come in at higher price points. And there's sort of two schools of thought around that. You know, one is you start there and it eventually finds its way and is democratized. But we haven't always seen that. So 
if we really want these super healthy options to reach everyone, um, what do we need to do? So I can uh, take a stab at that question, but I think um, one of the biggest things for relevant to the WIC, as I touched on earlier, is that um, you know the WIC food package varies from state to state. So even though there's federal regulations outlining the nutritional requirements for what foods can and cannot be approved into the WIC food package, um, states also have their own preferences as well. And so um, one big thing that we know within WIC is that the federal regulations don't actually bar organic food from the WIC food package. If you look at the federal regulations, it's actually, it's allowed. Um, but there's, uh, to my knowledge, roughly only like two states that allow organic foods. And the reason for that being that there's massive concerns for cost containment. Um, you know, WIC agencies want to make sure that they have enough money in their food dollar budget to be able to allow every possible participant that is on the program to be able to buy, um, you know, the food that they need. And so I think it within WIC specifically, it tends to be an, a concern over ensuring that you can serve everyone versus, um, you know, offering, yes, the more expensive items, but then the concern of cost containment or, or running out of the food dollars for your program. Um, and so, you know, within the National WIC Association, obviously, um, you know, we, we do, we are a membership based organization, which includes local and state WIC agencies, but also food manufacturers. And so we do try to partner um, with manufacturers that have uh, missions and visions in alignment with our organization to help navigate that landscape. Um, and so I, you know, there, there are also a couple other like lobbying efforts um, internally that we're working on, um, trying to explore ways in which um, the food package could be expanded. Um, and that's more on our public policy government affairs team. Um, but we're always trying to explore ways in which we can increase the quality of food that is provided to WIC participants while being aware of the vegetary constraints of the program. Um, and I just realized that I think there's a lot of assumptions about the WIC food package, like people thinking that organic isn't allowed when in fact it is, but the state has the right to make the decision to not allow organic on the food package. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And um, yeah, go, go ahead. No, I, I just wanted to say another way, you know, that, that WIC, WIC reaches so many people, but we also have to consider that children receive about two thirds of their meals at, in the child care setting, in the early care and education setting. And so the child and adult care food program is another great way uh, where we can get providers or caregivers to offer uh, more fresh fruits and vegetables to children. And so I'm so glad that Betsy is here and that this is an effort for industry because we can partner with programs such as uh, the Child and Adult Care Food Program where uh, child care providers or early care and education providers get reimbursed for serving healthy meals. So how do we work in partnership to make sure that they will get the reimbursement but they're still serving those wonderful products like the ones uh, in, that Tiny produces. And so just remembering that because we have 11 million children in the US that attend some form of, of, of child care. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, Yolanda wants us to know that here in central Ohio, the food bank system actually distributes more fresh food items and shelf stable non-perishable items. Um, often it seems like the hindrance is access to all of the things needed to make a meal, i.e. pots, pans, seasoning, stove, et cetera. And um, that definitely is the case, no question, you know, for some folks and, and one that we should address. Um, so um, Felicia asks, and this might be out of the, beyond the purview of what some of you are most interested in, but I think it's worth putting on the table. Um, what, are, what are some tips for getting preteens and older teens to start eating veggies? I'll start off because I might be the only one who had preteens <laughs> who are now pre-20s. I mean, um, my, my, I, I have a son and a daughter um, who are good eaters now, but you know, peer pressure is a big, 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 big thing. And I, I do think one of the keys when your kids come into the teen years is um, finding recipes that look fun and, and letting them make them with their friends. You know, I mean, if it's hard, I know for working moms to always be able to do that. But if you can create a time for some reason, kids of all ages, frankly, when they're part of the creation, you know, that can be an exciting thing. Another thing I find for teens and all, especially boy, my son who grazes, if you sit it out, you know, in other words, his thing, what he would go to all the time might be a chip or a cookie or whatever. 
But if you cut up some green beans and had them in a bowl on the counter, or you cut up carrots and you had them on a bowl on the counter, people just take what's there. So that's supporting um, the plain view perspective. Um, those were some things that I thought were helpful. That works even with my brother now, who's <laughs> uh, not a preteen. But um, what do any of you have further thoughts or ideas about that? I, I agree with you on, on getting them involved. And I think that's just so important. I've done work with uh, middle school children with my dissertation and we used a theater approach where they were actually getting involved. We had a rap about nutrition and then they planned a dinner theater performance for their parents where they planned the meal. And so again, getting them engaged in planning the meal. What vegetables do you like? What will we prepare? Uh, doing something, it sounds corny, but doing something like a nutrition rap, if that's what communicates to them, go in and do that. Make it fun, make it exciting for them and involve them in the process. And I found that when you get to that preteen teen stage, that if you're giving them more autonomy, then they're more engaged and they're more excited about it. So just continuing on that path of what you said and totally agree with just putting it out there and making it available, make a shelf on your refrigerator, a place where you can have baggies for little veggies so they can grab them. Yeah. And put them out on the counter, you know, yes. <laughs> them and playing sports and they come in just have them sitting there and eat, let them get room temperature and, you know, eat what they will. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we have uh, several people who are coming and asking, have you partnered with this or, or will you partner with that? Uh, the Produce Manufacturing Association, uh, Produce Marketing Association has been mentioned. Um, they're a PHA partner we've worked with to great success in the past. And we welcome all partners, you know, helping uh, us with this organization. Um, a couple of folks have asked about other organizations as well. And I just want to um, take that, you know, th take that moment to say um, our whole organization exists on the, uh, under the premise that partnership amplifies what you can do. Um, you know, um, we aren't interested in doing anything by ourselves. Um, that's why we have these terrific folks on the screen and others. Uh, our whole model is to partner and to amplify the work of others. So anyone who's on this call who would be interested in partnering and helping us to accelerate this movement, we're all ears. Um, so another question, um, can you give some specific and practical advice for busy moms who may struggle with meal prep in general and need to reprogram their children to eat vegetables? So in other words, we're not starting with the newborn infant um, from scratch. We've got some habits to unwind, some reprogramming to do. We do have customers that are picky eaters um, or self-proclaimed and have been able to love vegetables by going through our, we call it a programmatic approach. Um, one way that we're trying to make that more accessible is by posting about our recipes so that mom can make them at home or dad, right, in the kitchen with um, with the children and, and make that a fun learning experience together with what you already have right in, in the kitchen. I think one of the things that really helped me as a busy mom was doing that meal prep on a, on a Saturday or Sunday um, and then and then freezing it right and so having just being able to kind of grab and go um, you know when you've already had that kind of you know dedicated even one hour on a Sunday to, to have a meal time uh, prep you know for me that was a really kind of practical way that I could um, figure out like what, what, what will my son be eating uh, when, and actually in that, it helped me to know what might I be eating as well. Right. Um, because part of what, what we love at tiny is that I can actually eat the food as well. And I, and I do, and I love it. And so, um, you know, research shows that if a, a toddler, um, and in, in particular, see a, a, a parent eating the food, they are more keen, uh, to try it, to enjoy it also. Um, and so, you know, something else the paper calls out is this idea of the regular family style meal times that they are positive, positively associated uh, with increased vegetable intake in children. So I think just planning around, you know, even just a few meal times a night or whatever you can fit into your schedule to have that, that those, those kind of precious moments together as a family, you know, staring into each other's eyes, figuring out like, okay, what are we eating? Having a, having a game about it, making it exciting. Um, you know, that, that's just going to engage them even more, right, to, to want to try new things. But I did find that that meal prep on, on a Sunday really did help mm -hmm. in getting different yeah. throughout the week. Yeah. 
I agree with Betsy and just doing things where you're you're able to prepare those frozen vegetables, having dialogue about the, the vegetables and, and building it in. And so I think having an aim to say, we'll have a vegetable at every meal, even breakfast, you can put spinach and eggs, you know, whatever you're doing, or, or if we're making, uh, I, I make something called cheesy bread and we'll put a little spinach on top of it or an avocado toast or whatever you're doing and making it something, it doesn't have to be too foreign. So allowing the child to taste and allowing uh, the family to get behind it, I think is really, really important. I think another cool thing to do is um, uh, to think about of all the way you pre prepare things to give them a choice, which one do you like best? Yes. You, know, you make broccoli three ways and say, which one do you like best? You make, and, and so they're choosing their favorite from among, and it gives them some agency, you know, in the decision. Um, we have Nayab here who's asked in the chat, um, what does food introduction look like in other countries and cultures? In the United States, it seems like purees and jarred food are the norm. What is the norm outside the US? Uh, I had the privilege of working for the United Nations World Food Program, which is working to help people eat well in 75 countries globally. Um, and of course, the answer isn't the same really anywhere. Um, you know, it's, there, it's always culturally appropriate. In Bangladesh, the youngest children eat a publicly distributed food made of lentils with some molasses in it. And we worked to help fortify that food. In Ethiopia, um, you know, we helped to develop a chickpea based, they're the largest exporter of chickpeas and mashed chickpeas. Um, but one of the things I have said is um, sometimes I found that some of the lowest income countries globally are actually providing more nutritious food to their youngest eaters than we are in this country, because often the governments involved in the United Nations has been involved in helping to fortify. It's really um, sort of criminal that we don't have more emphasis on you know, food for the youngest eaters because we know it's so foundational. Oops, I see I am at my limit. Um, I really wanna thank you all. You've been a terrific panel. Um, thank you for bearing with us in our challenges. Uh, we, we didn't get through all the questions in the chat, but that's just an evidence to how much more people wanna learn and understand about this critical topic. Thank you all for joining. And um, you can learn more about this initiative on our website, healthieramerica.org, and we will keep you posted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Through our partnership with PHA, our goal is to educate parents and families about the importance of balanced nutrition, palate development, and food allergy prevention. We strive to be a gold standard in infant nutrition, always following the research and recommendations. We look forward to continuing to collaborate with innovative trailblazing companies, and we're so fortunate to have the opportunity to work alongside them and our incredible team of dietitians, advocates, educators, and stakeholders. We hope to inspire other companies to reformulate existing high sugar meals, introduce new veggie forward meals, and commit to transparent marketing to help parents find the healthy options that they're looking for. As we work to embrace the Veggies Early and Often campaign at Learning Care Group, we hope to change our GrowFit menus to offer two vegetables at lunch multiple times per week instead of one vegetable and one fruit. We also hope to add additional vegetable choices to our infant program, which will help to develop their palates at an early age. Thirdly, we'd like to educate our parents to do the same and start their infants on vegetables before introducing fruits as well. So we have pretty ambitious goals for this campaign. Through it, we hope to educate as many parents, medical professionals, and other industry influencers as possible about the incredible benefits of the early introduction of vegetables. And with that education, we hope that these groups start to demand more from the food industry. The companies that are leading the charge to increase the amount of vegetables in baby and toddler foods today are all very small. And with that size comes increased prices to consumers. If we could grow demand of this segment of the industry and get better scale, we can reduce our prices and become more accessible to families across the United States 
And with that increased accessibility, we can start to change the trajectory of health for this country. Thank you so much.